Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, today is April 23rd, 2020, and this is the April 23rd, 2020 uh, edition of Reporting and COVID-19 Conversations with Journalists, um, an ongoing series of talks uh, sponsored by the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, which is a project of Columbia Journalism School based in New York City. I'm Bruce Shapiro, Executive Director of the DART Center. Um, we are going to be talking today about documentary filmmaking and the coronavirus crisis with Francesca Tossarelli, uh, Italian filmmaker. We'll be with her in a minute. Uh, first of all, I want to tell all of you that we are on Zoom, but also on Facebook Live. If you are in this conversation on Zoom, you can participate in it um, by putting questions into the chat. Um, Francesca and I will be talking for oh, about 20 minutes, but you can feel free to send the questions in um, in that time. And then we'll go to questions from all of you. The whole thing will run about 45 minutes. Um, I want to um, thank my colleagues at uh, Columbia uh, Journalism Review who are co-sponsoring this and helping spread the word about our series. And also uh, my colleagues at the Dart Center for Journalism and Trauma who are variously driving the car, getting the word out on this, and um, also taking notes for tip sheets, a running tip sheet for journalists that is on the DART Center website, site www.dartcenter.org. Um, our guest today is Francesca Tassarelli, uh, who is a filmmaker and also works as a DOP for documentary films. Uh, for Al Jazeera English, Arte, RAI, the Scottish Documentary Institute, uh, Al Jazeera Arabic and others. Um, she is a visual journalist with a cross media approach who has been focusing on social issues, conflicts, gender and migration for the last 10 years covering uh, stories on female rebels in the Democratic Republic of Congo, feminist activists uh, in Baghdad, Central American migrants. You can see her work on major channels all over the world. And, and she's here today because last month, as the wave of coronavirus overtook Italy, Francesca went to Bergamo in Lombardy, the heart of the Italian pandemic, um, a city which saw uh, 2,000 deaths in a region of 883,000 people and embedded with the Red Cross. Um, her footage of ICUs, of patients struggling at home, of paramedics um, was shown all over the world on Channel 4 in the UK, Al Jazeera and elsewhere, and gave many of us our most intimate glimpse into the crisis as it was playing out in what was then the hardest hit region in the world. Uh, now, New York has overtaken Northern Italy for that dubious honor, but her work is all the more relevant. Uh, and she now has, is putting it together into a longer documentary, um, Corona Journey from the Epicenter of the pandem Pandemic. Um, we're going to look at, before Francesca and I begin, just the last couple of minutes of that clip. Maybe Francesca, set us up. What are, what are we seeing? What has been going on in your documentary up until the moment of this clip? Thank you, Bruce. Um, well, hi, everybody. Um, thanks for inviting me here. Um, well, this documentary has been done uh, in the middle of March. Uh, and I was embedded with the Red Cross in, uh, in the area of Bergamo, the epicenter of the epidemic here in Italy. And uh, basically, I was following them uh, along with my partner, and uh, he was taking photos, and I was doing the documentary. And basically, um, we were introduced by the Red Cross. Well, first, we were taught by the Red Cross the protocol uh, because, of course, we've been working in uh, conflict zones, but, you know, 
the main point is here is to understand how to cover the, the epidemic. So they have been the first that uh, introduced us to the protocols and to the protective gear, how to use it and everything. And then, you know, during those days, we were embedded with them and uh, we were uh, driving our car, following them, and they were introducing us in the, during their missions in the patients' uh, COVID-19 uh, in their houses. And uh, so the main challenge there was probably, you know, getting the trust of the patients and the and the relatives very quickly and yeah. in a very strange way because we were all covered and our identity was was covered so that was probably the main the main challenge and and what just before we show the last minutes of the film what has been uh leading up to these last minutes in the film what had you been showing up up to that moment well, we were um, going through different houses where there, there were some patients and some, some people that had uh, respiratory problems. And uh, so um, we were in a, in, a, in a house where there was this very, uh, very old person and uh, they probably have been, you know, waiting for the Red Cross for a little bit. All the services were a little bit slower because because everything was uh, you know uh, completely full in terms of requests. So we we just saw the father and the son and uh, so the father you know uh, was in a very different difficult situation and uh, he has just been brought inside the inside the ambulance. Okay, yeah. all right. Kate, why don't you cue that up and show us? Se questa è una guerra e noi siamo i soldati che la combattono, l'unica cosa che salva i soldati dalla guerra è la fratellanza e il cameratismo fra di questi. In effetti ho capito solo adesso il risvolto positivo di tutta la faccenda. There are really sort of no words to describe the power of that moment, but do we know what happened to the gentleman going into the ambulance? Yeah, unfortunately, he didn't make it. Um, so he passed away uh, after, you know, like probably a few hours in the hospital. Yeah. Watching that as, as a journalist, um, to me, one of the extraordinary things about your entire film, but those last couple of minutes, is the, the intimacy of every, of every scene. It's not just that you're physically close. There's a way in which you are um, inside the the emotional orbit of these um, emergency workers, of their families. There's the the claustrophobia of the stairway, the close-ups of of the person being put into the ambulance, and I, I saw that elsewhere in the film too. Early on, there's a I think it's an EMT who just starts talking about how the images from his work are now staying in his mind. Um, how did you get that 
that kind of intimacy, which was both physical, but also about a kind of trust, when you not only are a filmmaker doing work, making a film about people who are not normally the subjects of news or documentaries, they're in distress, they're frightened, and you're also wearing all this protective gear. How did you, how'd you do it? I would say that uh, is a progression, like first with the, with these people of the Red Cross, we took, we took a lot of time to introduce ourselves, uh, for example, to, to talk about our motivations and about how we do films, how we do, how, which is our style, which is, you know, because there's a huge stereotypes around journalists that are vultures, are, are invasive, you know. So I think that is the first wall to break. And uh, of course, you know, once you get the trust of these people, um, they mostly forget about you and they have been the first that help us to, you know, to get inside the houses. And inside the houses, uh, there has been some magic that happened because, um, of course, it's a very distressed situation. And uh, I realized that, um, you know, the people that I, I met uh, understood very quickly probably the importance of talking about it. And uh, even now, I mean, I don't know exactly how it, it happened because, um, well, I, I think that it's about uh, being aware. They were aware that uh, Italy was in front of the rest of the world uh, for at least two weeks, you know, in advance. And uh, so, <clears throat> We, I, I try to explain, you know, this is a message. I mean, I know that you have the power and you, it's your decision. And uh, of course it's, it's difficult because it's intimate and it's painful, but you will make the difference. And this is not rhetoric because they made the difference. The, these people that uh, let me in their life made the difference for audiences abroad, you know, not only for Italians, but for, yeah people in other countries. You mentioned when we were talking before we started that you're still in, in touch with some of these folks, that people have actually wanted to continue the relationship with you. What's that been like? Yeah, this is very touching because, um, I mean, I'm in contact with uh, a few families and um, uh, some, of in, some of the patients in this family uh, are okay right now i mean some of them survived and i can't say that um, they are out you know of the illness because they didn't have the swabs wet yet so they didn't test negatives maybe they are at home they are getting better they are out of the uh, icu um i think that um if you if you enter in a life with uh, of somebody with respect and uh, and then you know they saw the documentary so i really tried to keep the relationship and and the dialogue within those weeks so they saw the documentary and they recognized themselves and they said wow this is me this is reality it's hardcore but you did it re respect me so basically um the fact that they liked you know the video even though it's not uh, i mean it's delicate but it's uh, realistic you know there's a lot of distressful scenes so um i think it has been a process so through the vision of the documentary they appreciate it and uh, so we kept in contact uh, with phone calls phone calls and then I, I met them again and uh, you know all of them tried to I don't know to 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 welcome me uh, in the, the best way they could as like some of them uh, with uh, uh, cakes uh, with books that they wrote uh, with CDs that they you know some of them were singers you know so I think it's also the surprise for them to see a different type of, um, how can I say, it's not type of journalism, but it's, yeah. it's just a matter of how you approach people, yeah. Yeah. how delicate you can be. There's also another part of it that is sort of uh, inside what you were just talking about, which is the, the choices you had to make once shooting was done 
of what to show and what not to show. There is, as you said, a lot of distress and you show a lot of distress, but there's also, I'm sure you were witness to kinds of physical suffering or kinds of medical procedures or, or details that you chose not to put in. And I, I wonder how you balance that, the sort of explicit depiction of suffering and it's the physical nature of this horrible disease or versus a little bit of distance and how you keep it watchable for people. How did you think about that? Well, first I got a ready mind when I was in the hospital that I didn't want to create very direct and graphics um, images. So I avoided even in, during the shooting, you know, like uh, big operations or, you know, like body parts or, and uh, so it's a thought that came uh, already in the shooting. And then, you know, uh, I've been working with an editor and uh, a video editor, and we have a very similar sensitivity. So we understood immediately, you know, on how to balance. And, uh, but mostly was done during the shooting because for example, when there's uh, the daughter of Madalena, that is uh, um, a lady that didn't make it and pass away. Um, I mean, at some point I followed the whole scene and it was really, uh, it was really sad. And, uh, and you know, as a filmmaker that these daughters were saying bye to, to the mother for the last time. And uh, at some point, you know, after the mother was already in the ambulance and uh, she, she went away, you know, the girl started crying. And honestly, for me, that was enough. So, I mean, I just told her, look, I'm very sad. I really would like to hug you. I can't. This yeah. is strange, but I can't. So, and they have been, I mean, this family in particular, kept writing me and uh, they told me, look, uh, like weeks and weeks later, we've been like in the middle of, you know, of, um, of some criticism because like there are some neighbors that, uh, that told us that we, we did wrong on exposing ourselves. But uh, by way, explain that, you know, that the world need to know. So I think I told them, look, you're just very brave. Yeah. Um, folks, in a few minutes, we'll go to, to questions from all of you. So you can certainly begin to put them in the chat. And I see there are some, some distinguished documentary filmmakers and photographers whose work I know on this call and journalists. So by all means, please, please chime in. Um, it, Francesca, in the course of doing this, and maybe in the, the time since, how have you taken care of yourself? And not so much on the personal protective end, which we all, it was clear, uh, certainly there are pictures of you in your PPE, but this, this is hard work. What, what have you done to take care of yourself over the course of this? I think one of the most difficult moments has been at the beginning where um, we as a community, you know, we didn't know exactly um, the, the, set, the new set of rules of a pandemic, you know, so I'm talking about uh, beginning of, uh, of March, so end of, uh, end of February, beginning of March. So, and when you don't have exactly, when you don't know the rules, it's difficult to move around. So I took some time, I took some time trying to understand which could be, you know, the right way to do it. And mm -hmm. also having, you know, it's, it's a, might sound stupid, but I didn't have any um, trouble in mind thinking, for example, to my, to my parents, because mm -hmm. like my younger brother is, uh, is with them, is taking care of them. And mm -hmm. uh, this is something light, you know, and this is something that keep me focused on what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a gesture of generosity. And uh, so in terms of uh, exposure, um, I think that, for example, for a filmmaker, like in this case, I didn't edit the film. Mm -hmm. So I was okay. not exposed too much to the distress again and again okay. and again. And also when I was like working for the news in this, like in March, I was sending, you know, rushes mm -hmm. and I was always in touch for the editorial uh, exchange, but I was not exposed, you know, mm -hmm. very much 
the exposure mm -hmm. has been, you know, after a few weeks with, with the main characters, with the people. Yeah. 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 And how is it, you, you, so much of your past work has been in crises in faraway places, in Baghdad, Latin America, in Congo. How is it different to be doing this work in your own country, a short drive from, from where you live, or a reasonable drive from where you live? Well, first, uh, yeah, it's connected to what I was saying before. Like, uh, this is something that affects everybody and all of us. So uh, um, it's not far. So this is why you are forced, you know, to do a deep reflection about why I want to do what I want to do and how I do it. And how can I try to make a difference with this type of style or story and uh, the fact of having this direct access, um, you know, was a very special thing. And after many, many years working abroad, uh, I found myself in a very special situation because, I mean, I forgot, I even forgot, you know, how it can be easy, you know, to, mm. to document and to report, you know, in a situation where yeah. there are not cultural barriers or language barriers. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Caleb Hellerman, who's a filmmaker, who's on the Zoom is asking, um, how, how concentrated was your filming? How many locations, how many doctors or hospital sites or patients did you work with? What, what was the, that kind of practicalities, the logistics like? Uh, it's very small. It's very small. Like I was working always with a, a same, the same group of, of volunteers um, for a few missions. So we are talking about uh, um, 10 days and uh, for the hospital, I've been uh, for that documentary. Now I'm doing another documentary, but for that one, uh, I've been just once, you know, in a intensive care, and I've been there like, you know, just probably for a couple of hours. So mm -hmm. it's really, it's really short in terms of filmmaking. Of course, that is not a documentary-driven, um, a character-driven documentary. So you know, like it's more like a portrait, and there are many different characters. So. I didn't, I didn't pass a lot of time, you know, with the, but all, always, I mean, it's, it's difficult because when you, you get inside like um, a patient house, you can't stay there a lot. It's also yeah. a matter of, uh, you know, like protocol as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and what, what was shooting in an ICU like? I assume you'd never done that before, right? Or, or had you ever shot in an ICU before? No, no, no. Um, well, I've been introduced by a very nice nurse and uh, everything was pretty, was okay. I mean, I, I, wis I witnessed probably like a few distress situation. I decided not to shoot them because actually it was not needed. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was okay. It was very intense, you know, the the exchange and the relationship with with the doctor as well. Just for just by chance, I witnessed um, a phone call where the doctor had to had to say to you know to a relative that uh, the mother passed away, and uh, the doctor was looking for for the for the relative since one or two days. So it was very very difficult for him as well. So. I have the feeling that sometimes that type of scenes, it's even more, like, talks more. Yeah, and, and what are, just maybe to add one little bit of context, what's, what are, what are the legalities in Italy? What's the legal situation around your shooting in the hospital? In the U.S., it, it, it's very difficult, right? We, we're the most litigious society in the world, and this makes it very hard sometimes to get cameras into hospitals. What, what were some of the legal challenges from an Italian or European perspective that you had to deal with? Look, uh, it is a developing thing. It's not, it's not still like, mm -hmm. uh, so I can talk about March and then mm -hmm. after March um, that of course, like the hospitals, the hospital here were uh, overwhelmed by journalists requests. So it mm -hmm. has been a little bit difficult, but you know, it, it took a little bit of time, but uh, it was okay. And then, you know, the investigation started about responsibilities, you know, of, of this spread. And so, of course, you know, some hospital became the target as well. And uh, so there has been a restriction 
and uh, like in the past few weeks uh, it, it became very difficult to get inside the hospitals and then you know it's very different if you talk uh, it, it depends on the hospital it depends on the region it depends if it's overwhelmed if it's not i think there's there's a space where where the journalists can can work you know and also it depend which type of journalism you are doing like yeah um fred richen uh from new york has a, a question. You mentioned that some of the neighbors were critical of people who were in the film. Um, what what was bothering the neighbors? What did they object to? Um, they were saying to the to the relatives that uh, they shouldn't ex expose themselves. This is what they say, and uh, yeah more or less that's it you mean meaning that they just show putting them putting the story out in public somehow was not the right thing to do so a yeah. sense of privacy exactly exactly but in reply you know the the daughter of this person that passed away said to him to them that uh, it was her decision and uh that they didn't know the journalists and and uh, the journalists had a very respectful approach and uh so well yeah, yeah that was her response yeah um fabio who is a journalist from from brescia uh says he's personally touched by what you're talking about and asks if you experience any differences in the way you related to people the fact that they were Italian and reporting for your own country was it, did you find it easier to gain the trust of people when you didn't have that cultural barrier to overcome? Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. I mean, it was, yeah, it was a little bit of time that I didn't work in Italy and I saw, of course, the difference because there's no other barrier of, you know, language yeah. or culture. So, yes. Yeah. I'm curious, have you, looked back on your own on your reporting in other countries uh are there things that now you might do differently as a result of having re done this work at home for sure <laughs> for sure i wouldn't do it differently um probably well, well when i was working for example in congo i was working with photography i was like living there for a few months mm -hmm. and uh well, the only way for me to work there was to work with some, of course, with Congolese people. So like right now with a little bit more of money, I would, I would try to create a proper, a proper team, you know, around me. And uh, mm -hmm. like from the base, like from the base of my heart, honestly, the, my approach is the same. Like yeah. I never go to a place and I start, you know, exploiting people or, yeah. um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I try. I try to to pass a lot of time in in the place where where I report, where where I look for stories. I'm curious when you were providing the footage to news organizations abroad around the world. Did you find that were they interested in the same stuff you were interested in, or did you find your, your the clients for your footage, not for your own film, but for the footage? Did you find that that the networks had a different story in mind or how, how did you feel about the ways your footage was bought, used, whatever? I think uh, what I experienced in the middle of March was pretty unique because uh, we were, Italy was the first place where finally some news were coming out because before yeah. Italy there was Wuhan and of yeah. course like maybe now we are getting some some infos that are getting out of Wuhan of what happened. Yeah. So I found myself like in the middle of you know not only the epicenter but also uh, no like the editors were were listening to me because they didn't have an idea. Mm -hmm. So I I didn't have many problems honestly and. Um, they were listening to my inputs and uh, they were asking mainly. Yeah, yeah. And, and then I have a question about, about your, own, your own film, uh, the journey to the epicenter of, of the pandemic. Um, and it's about sound. We've been talking about images up till now, but in a film about suffering, 
sound is also really important. And you have to make decisions about voices, you have to make decisions about music, about a kind of a soundscape, a temperature, an emotional temperature. How, how did you think about that as you were putting your own film together? That documentary has been done so quickly, you know, that yeah. the main point was the, uh, the relationship with the video editor. I mean, I know him and I know his sensitivity is, is similar to mine. Mm -hmm. So I was already working like in different projects and I was already like, I was still, I was probably still in the field. So we had some chats and uh, we've been working previously before together and uh, so i trusted him and uh, in terms of voices of course i do agree very much uh, the problem of the of the film is that i mean i did everything with the with the with the boom and uh, and that's mm -hmm. it i mean i never used the radio mics because i couldn't touch people and the situation the situation was very very fast so um i mean honestly i didn't have the time to to do like accurate uh, thoughts or, and also I was alone. So mm -hmm. like, uh, like as a shooter and uh, as a director. And uh, um, so I based everything on the trust with the editor uh, this yeah. time. Yeah, and so, so the key decisions about sound music and all that you left to the editor pretty much. And yeah, with some phone calls, yeah. Yeah. Um, if you were, advising um, filmmakers in other parts of the world about what what stories need to be tell, told going into this next phase um, where the pandemic is spreading and some places are just going to be catching up with Italy and the wave is growing. In some places it's going to be slower. In some places we are moving perhaps into a, a downward turn. What do you think the stories are that that documentarians and cinematographers are especially well equipped to make right now? I think you know that we will need um, many different narratives because this is a very complex story. Um, so it depends very much on the interests and the choices and the sensitivities of the of the filmmaker because you you don't really need to get into icu to talk about covid you know there's so many different stories around i would give the priority to what what you you feel close to you and the access Mm -hmm. Because if you have the access it, and if you can create trust, if you can tell things and tell stories like in a respectful way with, a, with an ethical approach, people will, will feel it and people will open up. So I would, I would go for, for stories close to the, close to the filmmakers. Mm. And again, folks, if you've just recently joined, if you have questions, please put them into the chat and I'll kind of find my way through them. Uh, my, my colleague Ariel is wondering about the people in your life who are not journalists. And sometimes when we do our, our professional work, it's kind of hard to talk to the non-journalists about that, or they may not understand what we do. Are you finding it any different to talk with non-journalists about your work now? Does the fact that the story that coronavirus is touching everyone change how people are thinking about you? I think um, for this topic as well, there has been a development. Like at the beginning, all of us were a little bit like end of February. We were trying to, to find the, the new set of rules, you know, the new uh, yeah. boundaries, the new, yeah. And so I had like, all my friends know exactly what, what's my passion about and mm -hmm. my job. So they always support me, of course, but there has been some that were a little bit, um, they got some doubts, you know, about me going around. <laughs> and of course, I mean, I, I can understand because yeah. this is the, this epidemic has like, touched us and uh, hit us in a very different uh, way. So at the beginning, you know, putting yourself in, a, in an isolation and uh, for everybody, you know, can get like 
can put you like in very strange psychological position. <laughs> and of course, I, I'm privileged because I can move. So yeah. I, I can, you know, I can feel that uh, like my position can create, uh, you know, different approaches. But then, you know, like with time and also with, with the results, you know, so with the, uh, with the people that are happy about, about how they are, um, the people of the stories, I mean, that are happy about themselves in the film, you know, everything, it, it creates the connection and everything, it's understandable now. How yeah. can I say, yeah. We spent a lot of time in this conversation talking about decisions you made in this work um, on this pandemic that, that turned out well, that were good decisions on your part. Was there anything that you found especially challenging? Anything, um, I, I don't want you to lay out your big mistakes, whatever they were for us, but what what are the areas that, that really caused you the most doubt or caused you to struggle with craft or ethics or anything the most? Well, um, like right now, I'm in the middle of the creation of a character-driven documentary film. And I didn't have the time to write. I didn't have the time to think. I didn't have the time to craft anything. But I found myself here with a commissioned and and then, you know, you find yourself like um, doing everything in the same time and trying to do it well. Um, so I would like to have more time, you know, to, uh, to create trust and to create bond and, and the relationship with my main character. So, but this is not possible because this is what is happening is happening now. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit quick. Yeah, and that actually relates to a question that David Gross has, is asking. He says, I'd like to hear about planning your shooting and reporting versus just going out. Did you script at all ahead and plan to find what you wanted or were you just out there and whatever you grabbed, you grabbed and then you and the editor worked it out? In March, uh, I was in the middle of, of I mean, the story was, was happening around me. So I, I didn't even have the time to do anything. I mean, it was just a matter of being the producer, being the journalist, being the, the shooter and everything. So um, no, like my main, my main tasks during the day were making the contacts uh, and trying to get the contacts of the police and understand mm -hmm. when there was the, the next uh, uh, transportation of coffins or whatever. So it was very basic, very, yeah. very basic. Yeah. yeah. Then, you know, I took like a couple of weeks in, in isolation. I went back to Turin, which is the city where I live. And uh, I started, you know, working and writing for, for the next project. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do when in your time off when you're not working on this or your next project? How, how, well, let me put it this way. How has the pandemic itself and this project, project changed your time off how how's that going i don't have time off now at all yeah at all but because it's it's a very special time you know I, and i need i need to work i need to do it now and also i'm a freelance so everybody yeah. i'm sure that everybody understand that when there is the possibility to work you can do it and you have to do it and then you can stay you know still like for for months and then and this is another another thing you know that uh, is touching all of us um i am i am i mean i know that i can work now so it mm -hmm. means that i can make a little bit of money now and i don't know what will happen you know in the next few months mm -hmm. um and what if my brothers or my friends you know will need will need me you know and i can be of support maybe with money as well so mm -hmm. i need i feel that i need to stay focused right now and uh, the only thing that i can do is this um not planning you know to do it for months and months yeah. um yeah yeah um i'm gonna ask more, one more from the room here and then i'll have one to get us to the finish line um eric Gamafi says, I'm curious to learn, this is about your own film, how and where you are disseminating it and who, who you think of as your target audience and has thinking about audience affected the content and style of this particular film of the journey to the epicenter? 
I've been working with uh, with a production company. So I've been talking to them and I try to understand, we try to find, you know, a uh, common place uh, about, uh, about the type of client and the type mm -hmm. of audience. So this is the result of, uh, you know, a collaboration. So mm -hmm. basically I put together the film and I worked with this editor and already knew that they, they have like a few clients and mm -hmm. uh, I was happy enough to, you know, to have like a few uh, technical things that were uh, kept. For example, I didn't want the voiceover. I didn't want, uh, you know, to have too many graphics or too mm -hmm. many, um, you know, it's pretty much a film that it, it's difficult to see a film like this, you know, in Italian TV. Um, we don't have a lot of documentaries, but I feel that sometimes we underestimate our, our public, our audience in terms of like very general audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it got a very good share during that night. And uh, I think it will be, I mean, it will be um, distributed by their partners that are Discovery into, into other countries. Let me ask you one, one last thing as we um, sort of get to the finish line here. Um, you're still in the in the middle of this as as we all are and you're working very intensely but if you look back over the last couple of months march and april and all of your work on this crisis what are a few lessons you have learned that are going to affect your own work going forward or lessons that you would like other let let's say younger journalists younger documentarians who are just starting out what are the most important takeaways that you've learned doing this project? Hmm. This is a good question. <laughs> it is a very good question. Um, well, I think that, well, not only the past few months, but maybe a little bit more. Um, I, th I, f I don't know. I think that being like flexible in terms of opportunities that comes to and like, and touch your, your, your path it's a very good thing. Like, for example, I was very, very much radical. That is okay to be radical. It's totally fine. But uh, like, until some times ago, I got a very specific idea in mind of being, I don't know, a photojournalist or a director or, you know, a DOP. So like, during the years, I discovered that, you know, uh, embracing many different type of, of uh, experiences that can be mm -hmm. very different different type of production that can be independent can be huge can mm -hmm. be you always being I mean you will be learning a lot of things and if you if you find your method and um, of you know uh, you will find your filter because of course I mean you need a direction Mm -hmm. uh, I think that in anyhow like all that type of experience will help you because I mean if like if we do documentary films, we know that we need we need so many different skills, and um, so yeah, this is something that I would say to somebody that is starting. Well, thank you for that, Francesca. And I should say that that tracks really well with a lot of the sort of self care advice which we talked about on the last Dart Center webinar with my colleague Kate McMahon. Um, really having a culture of learning and sticking with your ethics and mission and craft are psychologically protective. It's, it not only makes for better work, but it kind of helps all of us in a difficult time keep doing the job. Um, Francesca, thank you very much. I also want to um, thank my colleagues, uh, Kate Black and Ariel Richen, who made the machinery work, uh, Susan Kaplan, who is assembling the running DART Center tip sheet on our website, uh, www.dartcenter.org. We will be back next week with more conversations in the series. So please um, watch our website and our Facebook page and Twitter feed for all of that. Um, thank you to everyone on Zoom who asked questions and to everyone on Facebook Live who is simply paying attention to Francesca's wonderful insights and important work. Thank you. Thank I you just all. want to add something yes. that if there's anybody, I mean, I couldn't do it for like uh, right reasons, but if there anybody is interested to watch the documentary, I can just send you the private link. <laughs> Very good. And um, if, if anyone wants to um, 
email my colleague Kate, kate.black at dartcenter.org. Um, we can connect you with Francesca if need be. Okay, thank you all very much, and we will be back next time.